going to continue talking about further reactions of haloalkanes. So far, we've seen a solvolysis reaction, which we found out was a substitution reaction that was nucleophilic and unimolecular. Even though it occurred in three different steps, the solvolysis reaction, we say that's unimolecular because the very first step was the one that was rate limiting. We want to learn a little bit more about SN1 reactions. One of the things that we find out is that in SN2 reactions, we found out was that we always got inversion in configuration. So R always went to S if we had that. In SN1, if we start off with an R, we'll get a mixture of both the R and the S configuration. We get a racemic mixture that can occur. And so what ultimately happens is that the reason this occurs is because of the transition state, the type of transition state that we go through. And because of the bromine breaking away, moving away, uh, then we're left with the substrate um, that has an empty P orbital. So you see that here. And as a result, we find out that this, with just three bonds, this carbon is a carbon. We have a planar configuration, and it's an sp2 hybridized carbocation. All right, and so as a result, since the sp2 carbocation is a chiral, uh, then that means we can get attack from a nucleophile from either the top or the bottom equally as well, and that results in both an R and an S that is possible. Now remember that this is different, the fact that we can come in from the nucleophile from the top or the bottom, um, and that's different from SN2, which always came in from the same side, always the back side, and so that generated the inversion configuration. So in this case, SM1, we can get both of those. So what happens is that, what this means is that if we have an optically active secondary or tertiary haloalkane, we always get a racemic mixture. So if we start off with a pure R, then it means our mixture of products going to, is, is going to be a mixture of the R and the S. All right, and so that may be undesirable in some particular cases. Um, this also, um, while that may be bad, while this may be bad, you know, in terms of if we're trying to get just one product, what it does give us, however, is evidence that uh, we have a, 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 a symmetrical um, achiral series, all right? So the fact, the species, sorry, that, uh, that exists as part of this. And so that gives us evidence that this occurs, planar achiral, um, that it's, uh, and so because of that, then it points to uh, this particular mechanism. So this is one of the ways that scientists were able to confirm um, this mechanism, to really to figure out this mechanism and have it in contrast to SN2. What we also want to talk about is the influence of leaving groups um, and the nucleophile in these SM1 reactions. We've already seen uh, that polar aprotic solvents are really helpful for SN2 reactions, and uh, we've seen this also in the lab. And in the lab, we also saw that polar protic solvents are actually increasing the rate of SM1. All right, and so and we also saw that on our handout. And this is because of that, uh, the protic part, that again, having an OH or an NH group um, in the solvent can help to stabilize the carbocation uh, that is there, just the fact that it has this really uh, partial negative, partial positive, uh, can really help to stabilize uh, that carbocation. So these polar protic solvents help to increase the root. Also, a better leaving group um, just naturally is going to increase the rate. So again, if you have something like an iodine, it's a halogen, that's going to increase the rate. And then really the strength of the nucleophile affects the product ratio, uh, really not the rate. Um, and so we're going to think about the types of products that we can get um, as we talk about that in this section. We're going to figure out that SM1 actually competes with an elimination reaction. So a couple of things also is that the carbocation stability, the ability for it to form carbocation really helps um, in having an SM1 reaction occur. So what we can know by looking at many reactions, really hundreds and thousands of reactions, is that a, a secondary and a tertiary groups, they undergo SM1 reactions, all right? Because uh, they can actually stabilize uh, the carbocation through hyperconjugation and permit the carbocation to form. SN2 reaction, I'm sorry, secondary reactions can also can undergo SM1 and SN2 reactions. They can undergo both of them uh, because secondary has a stable enough carbocation for it to react, and it's also not sterically hindered enough to prevent an SN2. All right, so it permits both of these to occur. Primary groups really can only undergo SN2, and this is what we say formally. 
that's because primary groups are not really able to stabilize the carbocation through heteroconjugation. All right, and so we say that they can only undergo SN2, and they cannot stabilize the carbocation, and so they don't typically undergo SM1. That occurs. I know in the lab we may have seen some evidence uh, that primary groups did react uh, by SM1, um, and so typically when that did occur, they were fairly light reactions, um, and this also may be a function of the experiment. Uh, but generally what we find out is that uh, primary groups can only undergo SN2, and they don't undergo SM1. This all connects back, of course, to stabilizing the carbocation, allowing it to be stabilized long enough for a nucleophile to come in and to attack it. Of course, as we know, this hyperconjugation, we've seen this a couple of times, is really key to stabilizing the carbocation. And remembering, of course, if we have a carbocation that's forming with this positive charge, having R groups nearby, with um, additional electrons to help sort of donate through space. Uh, their electron density to help stabilize that positive charge is really the key here. So the more things, the more uh, groups that you have, like in a tertiary group out here, to help stabilize the carbocation, that's better. So that's why secondary and tertiary can undergo these SM1 reactions the best. We're going to move to talk about unimolecular elimination reactions. These reactions we call E1. Much like SM1 reactions, the very first step is the rate limiting, so hence the E1, so they're unimolecular. These reactions occur because nucleophiles, the same nucleophiles that take part in SM1 reactions, can deprotonate, that is, remove a hydrogen from an alkyl halide. And so really we find out that they are an alternative to substitution, and we know them as elimination. Overall, they would look like this, where we have, um, again, our substrate, carbon, halogen group typically, or some sort of leaving group, but typically carbon halogen, um, and then notice that we have a hydrogen that's here. Overall, this nucleophile, which is a nice strong base, ends up removing a hydrogen um, after the halogen goes away, and we end up with this carbon double bonded carbon group. Um, we end up with the base that's abstracted the hydrogen, and then also our leaving group. Uh, this product right here is a carbon-carbon double bond. Recall that this is an alkene functional group. All right, so we've seen that back in chapter two when we memorized our functional groups, and so this is the first time we've really seen it, uh, probably beyond that. But now we're generating this. So um, this is the elimination reaction. That was the overall reaction. Now let's see what this looks like in terms of the mechanism. The mechanism uh, for this reaction um, starts the same way as SM1, that is formation of a carbocation. So in this case, again, we have this polarized group, uh, carbon bromine, so partial positive, partial negative. Um, this eventually breaks, giving a little bit of energy, a little bit of heat, uh, but actually break down. All right, so it goes away. We're going to form a carbocation. Notice we're going to use a polar protic solvent, just like we do for SM1 reactions. So we generate this carbocation. We have our bromine, which goes into solution. We've seen this carbocation before um, when we had SM1 reactions. And now the solvent acts as a strong base, comes in, removes a hydrogen, and then these electrons go here to form our carbon-carbon double bond, that is our alkane, and then we end up with a protonated alcohol. All right, and so this actually ends up being a fairly strong acid, so it can go on and further deprotonate. But that is really just the reagent, and the main organic compound that we're interested in is this, this alkene. All right, so these E1 reactions uh, and the mechanism is really a two-step process. The first is uh, this breaking apart, the leaving group going away on its own, bromine, forming the carbocation. And then the second step is the electrons from this oxygen pulling off a hydrogen. Sometimes we say this of abstracting, subtracting a hydrogen. That hydrogen goes without the electrons, so these electrons move here, forming a carbon-carbon double bond, which helps to satisfy the octet of that carbon, and then also forming um, a double bond here. And so what we'll notice, of course, is that as this forms this carbon-carbon double bond, that both of these carbons now are sp2 hybridized. And we know, as we saw previously, that the carbocation is sp2-like hybridized because it doesn't have those three bonds. This one's still sp3. But as this hydrogen goes away, uh, this bond comes in here. These electrons come here to form a bond, 
and then these both get rehybridized um, to an SP2 from the original SP3 uh, hybridization. A couple of things to point out is that we're showing the mechanism here um, with the base coming in pulling off this hydrogen. It could have easily come in and pulled off one of these hydrogens or even one of these guys on, a, on an adjacent carbon. All right, so it's always a carbon that's adjacent to this carbocation. So it happens to be this one, but it could easily have been either one of these two carbons since they're also adjacent to that carbocation. But nonetheless, we end up with an elimination product, and that is the alkene that forms. Interestingly enough, since that first step is the same, that is the formation of this carbocation for SM1 and for E1, what we find out is that these two actually compete. And uh, so they compete for um, whether it's the, the base comes in, pulls off a hydrogen, or if it attacks the carbocation. All right, and so the overall the rate of either the SM1 or the E1, they both depend on the carbocation formation. So this is really that slow step. Equilibrium, how fast this can form. And then the next step, which is either an E1 or an SM1 sensor competing, really is really the fast part of this. So, um, so again, bromine goes away here. Uh, we form a carbocation, and next it can either be an E1 or an SM1 uh, mechanism. And so we see that here, and so again, elimination would occur if uh, we have a solvent coming in. Uh, again, in that case, this would be methanol, so it's methanolysis. Methanol comes in, pulls off one of these three blue hydrogens. Um, it just so happens it happens to be this one to form the alkene. And again, that's about 20% of the product, or the methanol comes in, attacks that carbocation, and then ends up with the oxygen forming a covalent bond to the carbon, and we get this one, and of course, um, we've seen the mechanism before where we have to deprotonate uh, the other hydrogen that's here, the, this black one that comes here. It ends up, this is about 80% of the product. All right, so these really are competing uh, for this carbocation, the, the SE1 and the SM1, and really in, it's interesting that methanol is the solvent, and the solvent either reacts uh, with the carbocation and forms this, or it um, pulls off one of the hydrogens here. Um, I should point out that uh, the, the fact that we only get about 20% elimination is actually fairly typical, and this 20% is probably sort of high. Um, we find out that E1 reactions really are, tend to be minor, um, and they almost are a, um, uh, a product that's, uh, that sort of just contaminates, really, you can almost think about a contamination, because you really typically, with these reactions for E1, you really can't um, get this one to be the primary product, you can't, usually as an 80%, under, except maybe some really unique molecules or unique circumstances, but the general thing is it's, it's a sort of a byproduct, it's almost a contaminant um, that we would see I um, mean, one of these reactions. All right, and so we typically are going to find SM1 reactions that are much more uh, prevalent. Um, again, we're talking about the rate. Um, so let's bring back, so again, the idea of the rates, and we'll go with black here, is that remember that the rate of either one of these, since it depends on this, um, is really just equal to the, I'm just going to call it the substrate, and that is the carbon halogen bond. Um, and um, and that's really dependent on this, so it's whether, so this would be both for E1 and SM1, that the rate is really by uh, this. It's a uh, union molecular, so again, that's where we get that one from. It only really depends on the substrate concentration, and again, remembering the substrate is the CX, and really how, how labile this bond is, how easily it breaks. We can take another look at this E1, SM1 elimination um, substitution sort of competition. Here, uh, if we have uh, this group, we have a tertiary carbon. This tertiary carbon has one, two, three different types of carbon groups attached to it. And again, here we have our carbon-chlorine bond. So if this uh, molecule is then reacted uh, in methanol and heat, we ultimately get four different products, one of them being the substitution. So the, this guy acting as the nucleophile um, attacks the carbocation that forms, removed, replacing the Cl, and we get this OR group. All right, so this is our substitution product. And we get this in fairly high percentages. Notice we get three elimination products. Why? Three elimination products, well, again, remember going back, that we have one, two, three different uh, R groups attached. 
Um, and again, shown here in three different colors. So in the first case, what happens is this guy's a weak base, but nonetheless it can act as a weak base. It can pull off one of these red hydrogens. And again, we get this elimination product. Well, what happens if it pulls off a blue? Well, we get a different product, this carbon-carbon a double bond. Notice that this one gives a different product than that, so this is different. And then finally, what happens if the base just happens to pull off this green hydrogen? And again, we get yet a third elimination product. All right, so three products um, compared to this one substitution. Likely, uh, the substitution is much higher percentage, again, about 80% or so, and these are just smaller uh, side products, you might think of them. To highlight this a little bit differently, if we have CH3, three, so we have this tertiary carbon, and this is our leaving group, the CL. Um, if we run this particular compound through the same sort of reaction where we use a relatively weak base and heat, the ratio that we end up with highly favors SM1. In this case, it would be about a 95 5% mixture. Uh, so again, heavily dominated by SM1, this would most likely be a side reaction because in this scenario we would almost surely be going through the SM1 um, product um, and this would not be very efficient. So in order to actually favor the elimination, we normally use a different mechanism known as an E2, elimination by molecular, which we're now going to talk about and see how we can actually favor more of the elimination product. How do we favor E2? Well, generally we're going to use a strong base to favor the elimination. So again, a high concentration of base, and it's typically going to be a strong base. The rate of the alkene formation, the double bond that we form, becomes proportional to both the starting halide and the base. So again, the substrate and the base. And so those become equal um, in terms of the, the rate becomes equal to those. And, and unlike the E1 elimination, which is just favoring and looking at the carbocation. So again, we're using the same compound we saw on the last slide. We're reacting with a strong base. Notice we get a double bond here, NaCl and H2O. And the kinetics end up being that so we get um, this rate is equal to the rate constant. Um, again, to the starting material, the substrate, and then also this. And so the kinetics get there, and we get this in a much higher percentage, uh, much higher than 50% uh, uh, for the elimination that we would end up seeing. Um, by the way, uh, this E2 elimination occurs in section material, section 7.7 .7 in your textbook. And uh, while, the, while the syllabus skips over the seven, uh, section 7, nonetheless, we are going to continue to work on this uh, material in E2 elimination. So again, strong bases, RO, um, OH-, uh, these are really strong. Something like methanol is fairly weak, but they can attack the haloalkanes uh, before the carbocation is actually formed, and so as a result, uh, they can attack, and so they can actually undergo this elimination. What we find out is that the hydrogen is extracted or removed from the carbon next to the leaving group. All right, so these are always on adjacent carbons. So if this is our carbon chlorine, it's going to be a carbon that's adjacent to it, so one of these hydrogens that are going to occur. Now, interestingly enough, Maybe I should sort of set this up, is that it's going to be a hydrogen that's sort of on the opposite side. You'll see where that comes from in just a second. But nonetheless, it's going to be a hydrogen that is going to be on a carbon adjacent. Uh, this carbon is going to be adjacent to this one. Um, when we have a primary or secondary system, uh, we can actually get competition. On that previous example, we had a tertiary one, and we could favor the E2 elimination. However, in something like this primary system, again, noticing a strong base, so we have the RO minus, and in solution, it looks like RO and a plus, but that's how we can get it in there. But again, it's in methanol. And so again, noticing that our substitution, um, this would be an SN2, is highly favored, 92 to 8%. All right, so um, in this primary and secondary, again, we're still going to favor the substitution. Tertiary, we can actually favor the elimination. Interestingly enough about this is that E2 reactions, they proceed in one step, much like an SN2, uh, so they're one step. And three changes has, need to happen in uh, this single step. Right, so we have to deprotonate the base, uh, there's a departure of the leaving group, 
and then we have to rehybridize the carbon center, and that's a change in the hybridization uh, that would take place. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this. Um, so building upon this mechanism, so again, noticing we have our base that's here, again, strong base, O minus. And also notice that we have a particular orientation. I sort of alluded to this on the last slide, where you have a carbon-hydrogen, and you have this carbon-carbons, and you have a carbon-chlorine that's there. All right, so this particular position, you might remember, um, as we're looking back to our confirmation, is anti. So the hydrogen is anti to the chlorine. So that's an important thing, that it's anti. And then we're also going to find out that it has to be coplanar. So notice all of these carbon-hydrogens, carbon-carbon, carbon chlorine are straight lines, all right, indicating they're in the same plane. So we refer to this as anti-coplanar. So anti to one another, and they're also in the same plane. Remember, that's diff what difference is the hashes and the wedges show that these hydrogens are going behind the plane in this case, and in front of the plane of the uh, that are here. But these are all in the same plane, so it's anti-coplanar. The oxygen comes in, notice in this case, pulls off the hydrogen. These electrons are left behind. They come here, forming a double bond, and as it's forming a double bond, of course, it, this carbon can only have four bonds, and so this one is the best leaving group. So this goes away. Notice this is our typical transition state notation, so this is happening. And so this is all occurring sort of in one step. So we have all three of these arrows going, and this is moving along. So the OH pulling off the hydrogen to become water. This is forming an alkene double bond, and this ultimately ends up being our leaving group. And so again, notice our product has had water, alkene, leaving group, and so then in this case we've actually favored uh, the elimination. And again, noticing that this carbon, um, it is a tertiary one, so it was one, two, three groups here and there, and so again can help to favor the elimination by E2 mechanism much more. But again, notice three things. Deprotonation of the base, departure of the leaving group, and rehybridization of the carbon center, and again, so these guys are moving from sp3, both of them, and they both become sp2 over here. Let's take a look at the, uh, this uh, mechanism that we just saw, and using this little animation to see an, a base coming in uh, to pull off one of the hydrogens uh, from 2-bromo-2-methylpropane, um, and so again, noticing that the bromo group, so again, all right, so it starts to come in, so notice we have our base coming in here. It's going to start to pull off this double bond. Let's try that again. So notice our base is coming in here to pull off uh, this guy. And notice that both of these are being stretched, breaking, and then we're rehybridizing to this carbon-carbon double bond that's there. All right, so again, noticing that's all happening in one step. And we might remember that when this happens, we might remember that the fact that it occurs in one step, we refer to that as concerted. All right, so that was in, in a concerted reaction. Again, there doesn't have to be more than one step. It all happens at once, and so we say that it's concerted, much like the SN2. Here are a couple of things that can help us sort of prove that the elimination, uh, this E2 elimination is happening um, all in one step. All right, and this helps us to point to some of the evidence from the transition state. All right, so again, um, a couple of things is that the halo alkane, the base, must take part in the rate determining step since it's second order. Again, much like if we're an E1, there's always uh, just one thing that's important for the mechanism. In this case, that we can increase the concentration of either the base or the halo alkane, and that would increase, increase the rate. Again, the better leaving group results in faster elimination. Of course, that, in some ways that's self-evident, but what this implies is that the bond to the leaving group is partially broken in the transition state. All right, and so the fact that it's included in the transition state means that, again, that's why this leaving group results in better and faster eliminations. We also find out that the stereochemistry of the carbon-hydrogen and the CX bond must be in the anti-relationship for the reaction to be fast. All right, so it has to be anti-coplanar. We see an example of this, and we've already talked about the anti-coplanar, is that we have this hydrogen here, um, the bromine there. So again, noticing that if we looked at them end on, this would be anti-coplanar. Uh, and we would see that. And so again, a base coming in, we could pull this off. 
we would end up forming this double bond uh, that occurs there. Now, again, ring structures um, are sort of, I mean, they can flip back and forth between chair, but we can actually get this into that anti co planar. What happens if we had a slightly different product here and that we actually had, instead of our hydrogens being anti co planar, um, is that they are a little bit more this way? All right, so, uh, and so in this case, they're not anti. Um, so the, when this one's here and the bromine's sticking off there. All right, so in this trans relationship, so this would be the trans um, particular isomer, we would not get that very fast kinetics. It's actually very slow because the hydrogen's not anti coplanar. Uh, might be the planar. I'm sorry, yeah, coplanar might be in the same plane potentially, but it's not anti. All right, so that makes this ultimately very slow. All right, whereas this guy, which is our, our cis isomer, um, is anti coplanar and this occurs uh, very fast and allows this to go. So what this might look like, if we think back to our earlier confirmations, so if we look at this end on, what we notice is that, uh, again, we're drawing this as the, this yellow circle that I here would be this front carbon. All right, and so again, noticing that our hydrogen would be down all right, so this would be another hydrogen. And this is a this, and this next one's a little tricky to draw, so it would actually be part of the ring. So we'd have this CH2 that comes out here. Um, we'd have one another CH2 here. C that goes there. This would be coming down to a CH2. And then even down to another CH2 before it would link back up. Actually, let me get rid of that. This would be to the carbon behind. So I would go there. But to help satisfy that carbon behind, again, what we would notice is that we would have our BR. And so, again, uh, this one would look like here, where we'd have anti coplanar that would get us. So the base would be coming in. Again, this is anti coplanar. And so this connects to here. And what we would find out is that if we drew this particular one, what we would not find is that it would be here, and so um, this would be a slightly different orientation, but the bromine would ultimately be coming off to the side because it would be a different orientation that would be occurring. All right, and so um, coming off to the side, and so then we would not be able to have the in the anti position. All right, so nonetheless, uh, this helps to set up. And so this is uh, the E2 mechanism. Again, this E2 mechanism is in section 7.7, .7. a little bit of information about that in your textbook. And uh, you can see how the E2 is different from the E1. Let's take a deeper look at this substitution versus elimination. And what we find out is that the reason that we get different products at different times is that the structure really determines the function. And really we think about the structure with both of the substrate but then also of the nucleophile base uh, that is involved in this. So again, structure and properties really determine the function. So first of all, let's take a look at this. Weakly basic nucleophiles give more substitution. All right, so because they are weakly basic, they don't have as much ability uh, to remove a hydrogen. And so they ultimately result in more substitution. So a good nucleophile that is a weaker base than OH- would include things that we've seen a lot of, iodine, bromine, some of these other groups. All right, so fairly weaker bases than OH- in those cases, we're going to get SN2 when we have primary and secondary halides, um, and we're going to get SM1 uh, when it's tertiary. All right, so again, we're going to see that. So again, good nucleophiles, but they're weaker bases than OH minus. So they're, again, pretty good, but they're not really strong, and so those are going to tend to give us more substitution. And we see that example here, again, in this particular case, where, again, we have really this carbon, which has a secondary group, here the BR, and again we get 100% of uh, this product. And, um, and again that occurs really, um, this sort of 100% or nearly 100% would occur sort of in both of these cases where we have the iodine, and then we also have one of these RCOs, so carboxylate group, again which are our weakly basic nucleophiles, again giving us about 100% uh, substitution. When we have a weak nucleophile, those react at, uh, via SM1 at appreciable rates. And rates. Uh, this occurs with secondary and tertiary groups, 
and we find out that E1 is usually minor, as we've seen. So again, 85% of this, about 15% of this. Again, noticing it's a weak nucleophile, so we have, um, in this case, we have, it's water, something that's a weak nucleophile, water, and it's mixed in with a little bit of ethanol. Notice we heat it to, to 80 degrees. Notice we really have to heat this up um, to get uh, this reaction to go, again, because of this relatively weak nucleophile uh, for the secondary um, substrate that's occurring here. So again, 85 to 85 percent. Again, weak nucleophile. If we have a strong nucleophile, we ultimately get more elimination as the steric bulk increases. That is the steric bulk of the substrate, the carbon chlorine groups, that, the thing that involves that. And so if we consider what happens with sodium ethoxide, which is a strong base. So this is sodium ethoxide. So basically it's two carbons, which would be the eth part, and then OH would be ethanol, and so then the hydrogen's been removed, and so we have sodium ethoxide. This is a strong base. And so with a primary group, notice that, again, the BR is on the end, we still get about 91% of the substitution, and we get a small amount of the elimination product. Well, again, that's primary. What happens if we move next to a branch primary? Again, we get steric bulk, and again, it goes up to, or get, well, this goes down uh, to about 40%, but the elimination product goes up to about 60. All right, so that's just going from a primary straight chain to a primary branch, and so noticing that we get this nice increase in, uh, in production of alkene. And again, we're going to see that primarily by an E2 mechanism. All right, so again, primarily these the primary gives uh, uh, SN2 products, as we see here. The branched, again, give, give about 50% between SN2, and again, this is E2. All right, so this is uh, occurring by E2 uh, mechanism. If we bring in something like a secondary group, again, the carbon group here, secondary bromine, and again, under the sodium ethoxide, Again, this goes down to about 13%. This goes up to 87 So the secondary, we've really uh, been able to move up um, in, in, that, in the percentage. So you can imagine that tertiary would be even more. And again, we say even more. Again, it's going to really give about 100% E2 products uh, when we have something like sodium ethoxide with a tertiary group. Um, if we take that... Um, sodium ethoxide and make it a weaker uh, base or something that's n more less nucleophile neutral uh, then we end up where we get a SM1 and E1 as we see here at the bottom. All right, so it gets covered up by my group here but again noticing that with the SM1 and E1s they ultimately compete with a neutral weakly basic but something that's really strong uh, basic again strong basic being like sodium ethoxide with the tertiary groups those give almost um, exclusive E2 products. All right, so we can see that the structure function both of uh, the substrate, the thing that gets acted upon here, but then also the structure we're going to find of, of and the, really how strong um, these bases are also that influences, as we see down here in the tertiary group, that influences the product as well. One of the ways that we can um, build a base, right, use a base um, to help influence the reaction is if we use a sterically hindered base. And again, these are bases where we have something like the O minus, which is relatively strong, all right, which is real strong. But then the things that are attached to it um, are bulky, and so then that tends to elim uh, to favor elimination because trying to get this O minus into a carbo into a carbon, um, which is positively charged, um, becomes more problematic because of the steric bulk that occurs. All right, so these are two of the more common. And so again, this and this are the same. This and this are the same, just showing you two different ones. So this is potassium tert butoxide. All right, so potassium tertiary uh, butanol oxide. So, and so here's the oxide part. Um, and so, uh, so this uh, potassium t butoxide is commonly used, and also this known as LDA. Um, so again, the lithium, notice here, disopropyl. So again, we have two propyl groups on the amid. All right, so that's here. And so again, this one's bulky. Again, the nitrogen. So these are two um, bases that are used, and these really help to eliminate. So even um, apart from uh, the things, the substrate, the carbon groups that are acted upon, uh, the bases sterically hindering those can also favor elimination as well. So let's uh, summarize what's really happening here, looking at those. 
Um, and this is, again, thinking about what, how can we favor substitution versus elimination or where the situations um, give favor one or the other. All right, so one of the factors that are important is the base strength of the nucleophile. All right, so the weaker bases, um, substitution more likely. It's just more difficult to pull off a hydrogen for elimination, and so substitution is ultimately a little bit easier. And so here again, looking at some of our weak bases. All right, so things like water, just an alcohol, so RO minus, some of these halides that we've seen here, and even like a carboxylate in, in this group, uh, these are um, these are all weak bases. And in fact, notice water and alcohol are so weak uh, that they do not react with simple primary halides. All right, so they need something like a secondary or tertiary to actually react in that sense. Strong bases, uh, the likelihood of elimination is increased. So again, anytime you stick a negative charge on there, that really makes it a stronger base. All right, so that's going to favor the elimination. So the point is, is that if you if you're looking at all the parts, if you're looking at the base and you say, all right, is it weak or is it strong? All right, so if it's weak, you're going to get substitution. If it's a stronger one, you're going to favor elimination. So that's one factor, that is the base strength. Another factor, uh, and this is factor two, is we call it steric hindrance around the reacting carbon. All right, so if it's sterically unhindered, something just like a primary, that substitution is much more likely. If we get something that's sterically hindered, um, again, that's a branch primary. If we get a secondary or tertiary, then we're going to favor the elimination. So once again, um, in the second factor, if you're looking at the carbon, uh, carbon-halogen bond, you say, all right, is it unhindered? Well, it's probably like a primary group, then substitution is much more likely. If we start to get branched for this guy, then elimination is going to be favored. All right, so again, this is for base. This is the really the steric hindrance around the carbon. The third thing that is important is really the steric hindrance around the nucleophile, that is the strong base. So if we have something that's unhindered, so these are just simple OH minus, all of these guys really not much hindrance there at all, um, then we're going to get substitution. If we get our, uh, this is the potassium terbutoxide, again, not, the potassium's not showing, this is the LDA, um, these are both sterically hindered, then we're going to get elimination, and it's going to really highly strongly favor. All right, so those are our three factors. Uh, we talked about the strength of the nucleophile, the steric hindrance or, or bulk around the carbon group, and then also the steric hindrance of the strong base. So if we're looking at a particular reaction and we're trying to say, all right, is it going to be favor substitution or elimination? We have three factors, and what you can do is for to predict, you're just going to treat the three factors have an equal importance, and you're going to let the majority rule. So you're going to just take this reaction, you're going to look at the strength of the base, you look at the steric uh, bulk around the car reacting carbon, and you're also going to look at the steric hindrance of the nucleophile, and it's either going to favor in all three of those factors, whether it's substitution or elimination. And so you can make just like a little decision table. And if you get two substitution, most substitution is most likely going to occur. If you get uh, elimination and three, two of those three factors, then elimination is going to be most likely to occur. All right, so you can just take a look at that and sort of make some decisions based on those three factors. And so let's bring sort of overall summary of the haloalkanes. All right, so thinking about these, primary, secondary, tertiary. So primary ha haloalkanes, um, if they're going to be unhindered, all right, so not much branching, it's always going to be bimolecular, almost always SN2. All right, so if we have a sterically hindered strong base, may result in E2, but again, the primary ones are, prim are going, to, going to give SN2 uh, most likely. Again, if we get some of the branching, we get a good nucleophile. Uh, it's still going to react predominantly by SN2, but we're going to be able to favor E2 a little bit more with some of the branching. And that these primary haloalkanes react very slowly with poor nucleophiles. All right, so these poor nucleophiles um, are not going to make it react very well. All right, so again, um, and maybe we've even seen a little bit of evidence of this from our laboratory experiment. All right, so primary haloalkanes. Just know that primarily, that primarily it's going to be SN2 mechanism. That we can get a little E2 if we really highly favor the elimination. Secondary haloalkanes are probably the most problematic. Uh, it's because they can actually react by any one of the four mechanisms. Compare that back to primary. We get mostly SN2 and just a little bit of E2. But here, secondary, we can get all four of those. All right, so 
a couple of things to think about. If you have a good nucleophile, um, not necessarily great, but it's just a good strong nucleophile, that um, SN2 is going to be favored. Really strong bases result in E2. All right, so a real strong base that we've seen before, something like an OH minus, RO minus, going to favor E2. Um, weakly nucleophilic polar media give uh, like an SM1, E1. All right, so again, something like a water or an alcohol. All right, so they can result in this SM1 and E1. All right, so secondary, uh, just know that this is the one that can give all four of those, the possibility. And again, it can give all four of those on a regular basis. For instance, in the laboratory, sometimes we saw, you know, maybe some reacted or didn't. But if you look at a really wide range of secondary haloalkanes, you can get all four of those on a pretty uh, regular and consistent basis. Tertiary, tertiary haloalkanes, um, again, concentrated base, OH minus, RO minus give E2 products. Uh, Non-basic media. Uh, yields SM1 accompanied by the E1 products, and this would be, as we saw, for something like methanol. And then what we say is, again, overall looking at large numbers of these that really don't observe SN2 um, reactions by this. Again, the steric bulk of getting uh, the nucleophile into that uh, tertiary carbon is just so strong, so it's so difficult that we don't get the SN2. All right, so this is for the tertiary haloalkanes. All right, so that's sort of breaking it down. Um, by primary, secondary, and tertiary. A good way to see this is in tabular form. So I really like this table, 7.4. For me, it really helps to lay it out. And so this table, 7.4, you might take a look at it. You might even uh, write it down, uh, just write it out. It really sometimes just helps in our brains as we write things uh, that we make greater connections. But what I like about this is that it gives a column here where we think about uh, methyl groups, Again, just talking about um, you know just one carbon with those on there. We haven't talked a lot about methyl, um, but uh, again, uh, there's not much to say here is that it just performs SN2 reactions. But methyl, primary, unhindered or branched, secondary, and tertiary. So we have this is our sort of our rows that occur here, but this is the column of haloalkane. Then it gives us what sort of nucleophile do we have? Is it poor like H2O? Do we have a good nucleophile something like iodine? I minus and then strongly basic, and then hindered, strongly basic, and then they're hindered. And this would be something um, like our tert uh, butoxide, this guy, or LDA. So again, poor nucleophiles, uh, not much reaction, primary and uh, methyl groups. Uh, we can get a small amount of SM1E1 with secondary and tertiary, and that's something that's fairly poor. If we get a weakly basic good nucleophile like iodine, notice we get almost exclusively SN2 tertiary group which doesn't react by SN2, we can get SM1 and E1. Once we make it a little bit more basic, we can get some substitution, but then we turn over really to elimination with the strongly basic from about the unbranched primary all the way down. And then if we get uh, LDA, terbute oxide, something that's strongly basic and hindered, we get some SN2, which is really the only thing can occur with methyl group, and then everything else is E2. So we can see really what's happening here is that we have, um, again, poor nucleophiles. Um, again, we have a little bit of SN1, E1, um, and then converts over to SN2, and then finally to E2, just in terms of the table. Now, there are some other things going on there, but generally that's what we see. All right, so this table um, is really good, and I would encourage you to, uh, to study this table and to make it your own. Maybe rewrite it in a way that makes more sense to you, or just to simply rewrite it. Um, and this will really help you to make decisions on a quiz or on the, the final as to what sort of mechanism is occurring with what type of al haloalkane and then also with what sort of nucleophile base that we see here. One other thing that we want to bring in here is that we've mentioned that in our elimination products uh, we get some alkenes, so some carbon double bonded carbon groups here. Um, so, of course, what we can notice is that from the textbook, they have these uh, lovely little spectrum, and they color coordinate everything. And so, again, noticing that um, we have our, a lot of CH groups labeled as green. We see that here. Um, notice we get our carbon-carbon double bond, and that gives a peak at about 1640. All right, and so that shows up, and so that's a characteristic peak down here. Um, we see in our zone 4 at about 1640. Um, also noticing that the hydrogens, 
that are a result of this carbon-carbon double bond, the hydrogen that are stuck to that, they give a peak just above 3,000. That's characteristic of uh, hydrogens that are connected to a carbon-carbon double bond, just above 3,000. We see that in alkenes. We also see that in benzenes, that they're just above here. All right, and so noticing that uh, sp3 hybridized, like these guys, are just below 3,000, 2960 or so, 2980, mm -hmm. and if you have a carbon-carbon double bond, it's above there. But nonetheless, this is just sort of connecting back to our IR spectrum of alkenes. All right, so this that brings to a close uh, this chapter on additional haloalkane reactions. Again, looking at uh, um, SM1, as we saw, the solvolysis reaction, but also then bringing in E1 and also E2 reactions to sort of complement the SM2 reactions that we saw in the previous chapter.